This month I'm returning to issues of Nintendo Power with uh, issue number 69 for January of 1995. With a new year as a shift comes in the look and feel of Nintendo Power magazine, let's see how they change things up. Our cover game of this issue is The Adventures of Batman and Robin, but that's not what we're focusing on here. Instead, the cover of the magazine has had a significant shift to reflect Nintendo's Play It Loud campaign. The logo has changed, have been replaced by a 3D graphic created by Rare on the same hardware they used to make the pre-rendered sprites and environments for the Donkey Kong Country games. On top of this, the fonts for the rest of the cover and how it's laid out have changed from the more formal Helvetica S font of the original to something that is less formal. It's still a sans serif font, but some of the letters have more irregular line width, like semi-handwritten. Further, some of the text is overlapping. This leads to a few additional problems. For example, the subheader items on the cover are all in white text, which hurts legibility in more than a few areas. It's the reason why I try to do outlines or uh, text for my captions and stuff, or my credits, I darken my backgrounds so that the credit text is more readable, readable. The change in the look and feel has also led to a shift in how the letters column is laid out, and for the worse, we have fewer letters this issue, and the editorial section is gone completely. First game this issue is The Lion King, a licensed platformer based on the film. The guide covers the first five levels, with the rest of the game getting covered next issue, so I'll cover it then. However, our first game we're covering in depth, and what I'll be talking about, is X-Men Mutant Apocalypse. This is an action platformer from Capcom with the player controlling members of the X-Men Blue Team, Cyclops, Beast, Gambit, Cycloc, and Wolverine, as they're sent into Genosha to stop their Sentinel project. Now, if you're reading the X-Line at this point, or if you're current on Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, a podcast you should be listening to, the situation in Genosha is less clean-cut at this point. There's been a civil war, um, the Genosian government is trying to do a more diplomatic and civil... and reasonable approach to mutants with, you know, mutants having rights and that sort of thing. So, again, it's less clean cut. You can think about this as being more moved further back in the timeline. As far as brawlers go, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse doesn't do a good job of translating how the various X-Men fight or how their powers work. For example, in the footage I'm showing here of Beast, Hank McCoy's thing is that he's in the comics, he's tremendously fast and agile for his size, and his feet allow him to grip to ceilings to give him a degree of stealth that other X-Men lack. Now, how you could do this is to make him strictly a melee fighter, but one who can attack downwards while clinging to ceilings and giving an assortment of leaping attacks or very quick attack animations. Instead, this game is a big lumbering brute. He can still cling to some ceilings, but its mobility is limited, which I think is takes away from this from the interpretation and depiction of the character of the game. Now there is an X-Man who does work for the big lumbering brood archetype, but that's not Beast, that's Colossus. And he's not in this game. It really makes it clear that Capcom got the visual style to work right, but not how the characters move and fight. Which is a bummer, because like, again, if, even if they aren't reading the stories, um, you could get a bunch of this from the art, I would hope, but not so much here, apparently. Next up is Robotrek, an action RPG from Quintet and Enix, and I believe their last game to be released in the U.S. The article has a rundown of the major NPCs, and it bears mentioning that in this game, the names of some of the characters, like Dr. Akihabara, have not been anglicized, as is the case in, well, often in JRPGs, like didn't, wasn't anglicized to Dr. Silicon Valley or whatever. However, there seem to be some elements of the translation that the writer of this guide felt to be rough enough to merit pointing out, but which were plot-specific enough that they didn't want to show them. The guide also gets into upgrading your robot, combining items, and the robot's combo moves along with the first few errors of the game. Robotrek is an RPG that is a very slow burn, but which lays out its style right up front. It's Quintet giving their own take on Earthbound, but with them attempting to emulate the same sort of subject of humor and laying out a world that is both nostalgic and not at the same time, but not presenting the same outsider's perspective on Americana. It's fine, but it also makes for a very different experience. I like what I played at the game, but I also get the impression that this is a game that I 
get more out of if I had more time to sink into playing it, and I should probably give it a full playthrough at some point in the future. Next up is Lemmings to the Tribes, a sequel to Lemmings, but a bit more narrative to it, as the plot has the Lemmings having to collect various chunks of a magic amulet in addition to getting enough Lemmings to the goal. Unfortunately, this is a very basic two-page guide without much in terms of level-specific strategies to show how or if these specific are specific objectives that I articulate here. So, the article gives the impression that there are additional objectives here of where you need to collect chunks of an amulet to get the good ending or whatever as you're making your way through the game's levels. That's not the case. Now, on top of this, Lemmings to the Tribes escalates difficulty a whole bunch very quickly from the last game, to the point that the second puzzle of the game introduces a whole bunch of new Lemmings that didn't appear in the first game, or if they did show up, they didn't appear until much later in the game. Without any clues on what these Lemmings do, it's not as self-explanatory as, for example, Oh, Blocker, Digger, um, that sort of thing from the first game. It's not a terrible game, but it feels like one that is a, almost unplayable without the manual or a really, really well-written fact. Next is Dragon View, an RPG from Chemco. The game uses first-person exploration on the overworld and side-scrolling action sequences in Dungeon. Dungeon sort of like a mix of Draken from a few episodes ago and Zelda 2. Dragon View is interesting. It, the presentation of the game feels like what you'd get if you mixed, well, Draken and Ease 3, the Oath and Felgana. Um, there's the side-scrolling content, combat of Ease, but the way of managing the overworld of actually probably ran more to Delta 2 than Draken. With the difference being that, well, it has Draken's presentation style with the use of Mode 7 and semi polygonal graphics and that sort of thing. Dungeon navigation works similarly to Oath of the Falgana, where navigation is done in the side-scrolling perspective with action combat like a brawler, where you handle your tactics through managing the angles that your opponents are able to attack you from. And then, like Dark Souls, the combat has some very deliberate elements, both in terms of tracking your enemy's attack animations, figuring out their patterns, and planning out your own attacks to take advantage of that. That said, Dark Souls has bonfires you can use to respawn, and Zelda 2 has lives that give you the chance to restart a dungeon should you die. Dragon View just gives you a game over. It's kind of crappy. I mean, you can, yes, restore from a previous save at a town, but it makes things frustrating because you have, you're lacking those chances to revisit a dungeon a couple times before you have to start over at the last town and if I have to fight your way back. It adds a bunch of busy work and tedium that is unnecessary, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's a failure, but it's an interesting failure, which is honestly the kind of game that I started this show to discuss in the first place. Is, I mean, yes, getting to play Zelda and talk about Zelda and why it works is fun, but talking to get the games which try to be Zelda and miss, but in interesting ways, is a lot well, more engrossing. We now come to the cover game, The Adventures of Batman and Robin, with an action platformer based on the animated series. The article gives a rundown of some of the early levels, and for some reason gets Poison Ivy's name wrong, calling her Green Ivy instead. The Adventures of Batman and Robin is more of a general Batman the animated series game, as I'm not encountering much Robin here, nor is there a two-player option. That said, the game is a visual tour de force. The animations are amazingly fluid, and the backgrounds do a tremendous job of evoking the show, and while the music is different from the show's music, there are enough commonalities there to make it work. Oh, and if you get a game over, the villain of the level taunts you like the Arkham games do much later, which is something I really appreciate. With that said, while the controls are generally fine, the grapple gun seems wonky and has some issues with coming to reading certain areas, and I'm honestly unsure of the utility of some of the gadgets. I mean, I kind of enjoyed playing the game, but there's bits of it that didn't quite work the way I'd like. Moving into special subscribers only section, we have a rundown of the top 10 games of 1994 for the SNES and top 5 for the Game Boy. No mention of games for this NES, though. 
Continuing with this section, we have a preview of upcoming titles for 1995, and at least one of these games, Comanche for the Super Nintendo, ended up being cancelled for basically them not being able to get into a playable state. Also, another year, another big Nintendo tournament with Powerfest 94, with the centerpiece being a Donkey Kong Country tournament. Uh, this was held through Blockbuster, and the tournament cartridges are, as you'd expect for these sort of things, fairly rare and worth a significant chunk of change. Next is an interesting article, and kind of a precursor to what YouTube channels like My Life and Gaming do. An article about the how to get the best picture and audio out of your consoles, both in terms of using as video inputs and also hooking the console up to your stereo. Moving back to the games, we have Pitfall the Mine Adventure, an attempt by Activision to revitalize the Pitfall franchise. The article gets a chunk of full-sized maps that earlier articles had been lacking. We'd gotten some of this with Adventures of Batman and Robin, but not so much for the other games. Except these articles also have annotations for points of interest on the map. It's interesting to see Pitfall get this level of coverage, whereas a game like Lemmings, where being able to see the whole level and plot out actions is an important part of the game, and knowing points of interest is... Um, vital in terms of knowing where you need to use certain lemmings certain places. It's an interesting difference. Pitfall the Mind of Enter is an okay platformer, but it runs into some problems with direction. I don't mind large levels with a lot of room for exploration in the game, provided they provide some quality of life options for, to, for example, let me know where I haven't gone and what my ultimate objectives are. This game provides neither, neither of those. On top of that, the game doesn't do a good job of distinguishing from what is set dressing and what is actual level environments due to their use of an overall dark color palette and very cluttered level environments. The game has some conceptual promise, but I do feel like this is a game that would be better served with some form of modern makeover with some slight tweaks in the arc design, controls, and interface. Just keep the concept of you're playing the son of Pitfall Harry, uh, going through these larger platforming environments, but with some just minor adjustments done to make what platforms you can stand on stick out a little more from the environment and where places you can't stand on or aren't passable or just background set dressing clearly kind of pushed to the background so you know, okay, that's not a place I could go. That sort of thing. Next is Arrow the Acrobat 2, which is technically the third game of the franchise behind the first game and Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel. We get a couple notes on Arrow's new moves and notes on the first level. Arrow 2 is a decent enough platformer. The game is, not to be redundant, decent controls with a little bit of clunkiness in how you handle combat. This is aggravated by the fact that a few of the early levels of the game introduce some obstacles that send you into situations where you will not only take unavoidable damage from enemies, but repeated unavoidable damage from enemies, which is immensely frustrating. Otherwise, it's something of an improvement from Era 1, but not a dramatic one. I can't fault the game, aside from the stuff I mentioned earlier, but I can't praise it much more either. Next up is Street Racer, a kart racing game from Ubisoft. We have some notes on the racers, which include some fairly racist stereotypes, along with some notes on level hazards in the three cups, but no maps of the tracks. Street Racer plays pretty solidly, but it's got some real issues with how the levels work. The on-stage pickups, repair power-ups, nitro boosts, and bonus point stars all get kind of hard to spot on screen, for large part due to how the background can cause them all to blur together. It really shows how elegant the level designs in Mario Kart are by comparison. I'd say this is notable for the reason that it's clearly clear that Ubisoft seems to have grokked for pretty quickly what makes the levels in Mario Kart work as the actual act of playing the levels and the width of the levels and that sort of thing works fairly well, but they didn't don't seem to have grokked, grokked how to handle distributing the power-ups, which is a hit-or-miss kind of affair. We have more info on the Virtual Boy, including notes on how the game sends a 3D picture to the game to the player. And with this comes an article on Shoshin Kai, Nintendo's dedicated game expo in Japan, which would later become known as Space World. The article includes the first map we've seen thus far of Chrono Trigger, 
along with a bunch of our other RPGs that won't see a U.S. release for a while, if at all, and all of them not receiving that release on the the uh, Super Nintendo, instead getting released on other consoles in the United States. Front Mission, Tales of Fantasia, Dragon Quest VI, and Mystery Dungeon 2. While the look and feel of Nintendo Power has changed over time, the classified information column has stayed more or less the same. This issue, we get a stage select code for the Jungle Book. Next up is a fighting game. Brutal Paws of Fury, a console original fighting game with funny animal characters. There are notes on seven of the playable characters, along with the mention that you unlock special moves by winning matches, and you can take those special moves with you by entering a password, which is a novel concept. Unfortunately, Brutal Paws of Fury is a kind of mediocre fighting game. I found myself liking much feedback on... Well, whether I was doing dedicated, strong, medium, or weak attacks. Indeed, if there was any difference in kind of attacks, I couldn't tell. The animations were pretty much the same, and nor could I tell why I wasn't able to block attacks, whether it was due to poor timing, or not using the right button input, or using a button input in the first place. In short, I couldn't tell what I needed to do to succeed. And consider the thing that powers you up in the game is playing more matches and winning them to unlock more special moves, that's a big problem. And the fact that the game has a limited number of continues does not help. Next is Star Trek Starfleet Academy, a Wing Commander style space simulator that puts you in the captain's chair of a Federation starship, albeit in a training simulator. The gameplay is lower impact than Wing Commander, as you don't have to worry about permanently killing off your possible wingmen if you screw up. The game also includes some special levels based on episodes of the original series and some of the movies, all of which were uh, TOS era stuff. The issue includes some notes on the first 20 levels. There are things I fundamentally like about Star Trek Starfleet Academy. I like how the game implements James Horner's score from Star Trek 2 and 3 in chiptune form. I like how the game captures the look and feel of the Star Trek setting. I like a lot of the little things they do and help in the game to help you position yourself in space with the ship and the little um, monitor on your console. But I don't quite like flying the ship. Maybe it's because I haven't played on my own Starfleet Command before I played this game for the first time, and then having played a lot of Star Trek Online after that. However, those games, Star Trek Online and Starfleet Command, made starship combat feel like starship combat. Putting you in a big ship which can shoot not just like straight ahead, but has other alternate firing arcs that you have to think about when you maneuver your ship and having to manage your shield strength on different angles and handling repairs on the fly and that sort of thing. Whereas, well, Starfleet Academy makes this Federation starship feel like it's bigger than the fighters from Wing Commander, but handles like the fighters from Wing Commander. To put it another way, also, it, I don't feel like I'm flying the Enterprise. And that's the problem. Additionally, the scenario selection is a little hit or miss. Um, like, for example, some of the classic space episodes, like bottle episodes of Star Trek, are ones where the Enterprise faces some sort of weird stellar metal megafauna, like a giant amoeba, and that space amoeba, and that sort of thing. And the game doesn't have any scenarios like that either, where it's, you're not fighting other starships, you're not tractor beaming a uh, mine away, you're running to just weird stuff in space, and you have to smart your way around it, and the way you resolve it is talking to your members of your class on your bridge crew and handling problems that way. I would have loved to have a situation like that one in this game, but we really don't. Also, as far as for whether or not to pick up this version of the game, the funny thing is, this game got remade for PCs with a total upgrade. It's got 3D ship models and bridge environments and full motion video cutscenes, complete with major appearances by William Shatner, Walter Koenig, and George Takei. And the game's on GOG, and it's not very expensive. I recommend getting that version. It's worth it, and your computer can run it. She's from the mining colony on Rigel 12. In the Next up is Kid Clown and Crazy Chase, a platformer with a fixed isometric perspective. Because of this perspective, the screenshot maps, or the, the idea of using screenshot maps, isn't entirely viable. The article covers the two objectives of each level. 
Collect all four suites of cards to proceed and reach the end of the level before a bomb goes off. It kind of the problem that it is, well, a game in a fist isometric, isometric perspective with sprite-based graphics. Now, this game manages, manages to find ways to make this perspective work in some respects, but not quite all. So, for example, in order to progress in the level, you have to jump and grab strings underneath balloons, which will release either coins, HP items, bombs, or the three card suites that you need to complete each level. However, judging your distance on those jumps is difficult because you can't go back, and then if you miss just one, then you have no choice but to go and do another loop, taking a score hit. You do regenerate some health before you start over, though, but it's still frustrating. Now, it I was able to get the balloons a lot of the time, but there's nothing more frustrating than just missing the balloon that you need and wondering if that's the one that has the card suite you need to progress. That said, the game is very pretty. The sprites for the characters are very impressive, and the game has a really strong sense of humor, with various humorous events taking place over the course of the game levels, with Clown having humorous and expressive reactions to, in rea to those events. In particular, one of my favorites is the second level, where the villain leaves up to attack you, and if he misses, he ends up going into traffic and hit by a car, while Kid Clown just looks confused. Now, this isn't a perfect game, but it's fun, and that's what I'm looking for in a game. The second to last Super Nintendo game this issue is Animaniacs, a platformer based on the cartoon show. As with a lot of games with a studio backlot concept, the game puts you in a bunch of themed levels based around various film genres, and in the case of this game, you need to find script pages on those stages to get the best ending. Animaniacs is shockingly unforgiving. It's a game that basically gives you three lives total, with sort of no continues. You can technically enter a password for unlimited continues, but you have to actually enter the password to get the continue. It's kind of impressive that a game based on a kid's show can be so brutal in that respect. The game still looks fun and plays well, and the controls are okay. It's just that the learning curve is more like a learning cliff, because it doesn't give you a chance to pick up quickly where you left off when you make a mistake. The last Super Nintendo game this issue is also based on a cartoon show, but a shorter-lived one. Biker Mice from Mars. Uh, this game appears to be modeled on rock and roll racing. Yep, Biker Mice from Mars is, as I suspected, uh, Konami's take on rock and roll racing with a few kart racing elements. The game gives a mostly randomly selected power-up once per lap, granting everything from a nitro boost to stopping everyone's movement but your own to an earthquake that slows everyone, including you, do a crawl, so if you're in the lead, they can't catch up. Additionally, missiles don't become available after the first lap, so you have that first lap to kind of see everyone shakes out in terms of skill and vehicle performance. To the game's credit, it seems to have one that continues, and it has upgrades be persistent between rounds, and continues for that matter, so if, you, so if you have a slow start, but by the end of the circuit, you maybe don't have enough to win, but do have enough cash to upgrade your tires and weapons. When you continue and start the circuit over, your tires and weapons will still be upgraded. It's a decent execution and gives the player a reason to keep playing. In Kansas Corner, we have a whole bunch of questions about Demon's Crest and Evolution of, on Illusion of Gaia. Moving into Game Boy games, we start off with a trio of uh, portable versions of Super Nintendo games with NBA Jam. Most portable versions of sport games work poorly enough that I just skip them outright, as with the third of the titles this issue, but this one I'm going to give a shot. NBA Jam on the Game Boy has a lot of the problems the console versions have. The EI has real problems with rubber banding, which makes playing single player a very uneven experience, and has some difficult issues with identifying what player is active, in the sense of ours having the ball. So if you want to have your strong jump shot guy go for a three-pointer, it's hard to identify who that is. However, this is aggravated by the fact that the Game Boy version doesn't seem to have a two-player mode, so you can't bypass the uh, rubber banding by, you know, just playing with a friend. Further, score information is moved from popping up when somebody scores, like on the console version, to being in the background and easily missable, unless you're paying really close attention. Worse, we've lost a lot of elements of the presentation which give the game flavor, like the announcer stating if a player is ON FIRE! And further, just to put the icing on the cake, the turbo button is mapped to the start button, 
making turbo, hitting turbo, and then hitting the uh, shot button to do a dunk rather difficult. I recommend sticking with the console versions. Next up is Daffy Duck and the Marvin Missions, which is a platformer, and these are definitely a mixed enough bag on the Game Boy. This can either work perfectly or fail outright. Daffy Duck and the Marvin Missions is harmed mechanically by the limitations of the Game Boy. I remember being able to charge my shot somewhat in the SNES version, but I can't do that here. Also, the double jump is a lot less floaty in ways that causes problems with the level design, in part because of the size of the sprites and perspective with the rest of the level. It's one of those Game Boy ports where being on the Game Boy takes a lot away from the experience and hurts it tremendously. And then finally, the nope, I'm just skipping it department, we've got Madden 95. Football games like Madden just don't work on the Game Boy's screen. This game gets a miss for that reason. The top 20 column has been completely overhauled with the format shift. The NES ranking is gone, and the Game Boy ranking has been slashed just 10 games, which is disappointing, as the most movement we saw tended to be on the lower levels of the ranking. The other big names, like Link's Awakening and Wario Land, tend to be just too firmly entrenched. I anticipate some movement up here significantly later when Pokemon comes out, but until then, I don't expect to see much change. That said, we do get something to replace the NES coverage with a special cross-platform ranking focused on games with a common theme, this time focusing on RPGs. We also get a Hall of Fame with a selection of games that have been on top of the rankings the longest, which is where the NES games get their due this issue. In the now playing column, among them also rands is Metal Morph, Stone Protectors, and Ultima 7. Finally, in Pack Watch, Tecmo has Tecmo Super Bowl 2, Compile has Kirby's Avalanche, a Puyo game based around Kirby, sort of like how Mean Bean Machine is a is a, a Puyo game based around Sonic, and Koei has Brandish. They also mention Enix bringing Ogre Battle to the West, a game which I've visually found incredibly fascinating, but have never been able to play very well at. Not on any platform. My pick of the issue is, and this is going to be something of a weird choice, Kid Clown. It's not a perfect game, but the expressive way the sprites work makes failing just as fun as succeeding, which is something I appreciate in a game. It's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of the Worms games. As far as my thoughts go on the overhaul of Nintendo Power, it's a mixed bag. We're covering more games than earlier issues, and giving the games the spotlight and giving more games the spotlight is good. But they haven't found a good balance between more games and more coverage. For example, Lemmings could have used more information to showcase some of the new Lemming types in addition to, well, level maps, for example. We'll see how this stylistic shift plays out over the next few months. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.